Okay, you get used to it. Okay, you get used to it, but you don't get over it. Okay, so I recovered, you know, within maybe about half an hour, and I was okay, but it was still in the back of my head because again, I just remember just looking at his eyes. But we also had a new tech there, and it was her first week. Okay, and we had to send her home because her it was her first death, and she couldn't handle it. Okay. Now, these are some of the things that you're going to be faced with working in a medical situation. You do what you can. We are there to save lives. Yes, even in radiology, guys, you think you're there just to take x-rays and do ultrasounds. You're also going to be performing interventional type of procedures where you are saving people's lives. It's what we do on a daily basis. And hopefully you'll never be confronted with something like this, but when you do, you're going to be prepared to do it, right? Without hesitation. Okay? So in my case, yes, you have to be ready to perform CPR. Okay. Any questions? Okay, distributive shock. Distributive shock, okay? Distributive shock occurs when a pooling of the blood in the peripheral vessels results in decreased venous return of blood to the heart. Decreased blood pressure and decreased tissue perfusion occurs. The blood vessels are unable to constrict, and this results in the inability to assist in the return of blood to the heart. It may also occur when chemicals released by the cells cause vasodilation and capillary uh, permeability, which prompts peripheral blood pooling. All it's saying here is your blood pressure drops. When your blood pressure drops, blood that have gone to your lower extremities, okay? Think about this, your lower extremities are further from your heart, right? So they have a longer way to travel. Because your blood pressure drops, it isn't strong enough to return blood back into your heart and they pool in your extremities, okay? This is called distributive shock, okay? So it's, it's, it here has the inability for blood to be returned back into your heart. They get stuck and get pulled in the extremities. This is distributive shock. Okay. This is also known as vasogenic shock. Vasogenic shock. The two types of distributive shock that we're going to talk about is neurogenic and also septic. So neurogenic shock results from the loss of sympathetic tone causing vasodilation. Okay, vasodilation of peripheral vessels. So what happens here is your vessels become vasodilated. Okay, they remain wide open. What we want is we want this, right? So we can squeeze the blood back into the heart. This is vasodilation. It remains wide open. Okay, so there isn't enough constriction there to return back into the heart. So a neurogenic shock can be caused by spinal cord injuries spinal cord injuries. There is a lack of communication between your brain and your vessels, keeping your vessels dilated. Okay? Severe pain. Severe pain. Okay? Have you ever had anybody faint in, when they're going through severe pain? What happens when somebody faints? Your vessels vasodilate, right? So when the vasodilate, the blood isn't being pumped into your brain, causing you to faint. The same thing happens here. When you have severe pain, your vessels vasodilate. It is preventing blood from getting back into your heart. Neurological damage. The depressive action of medication. Lack of glucose. Okay, lack of glucose. Lack of glucose. Okay, what we're talking about here is someone who is hypoglycemic. Hypoglycemic. <coughs> Your brain not only needs oxygen to operate, but it also needs blood sugar. Okay, blood sugar. What controls the amount of blood sugar you have in your blood? <coughs> what controls that? The insulin. Okay, insulin. Where does it come from? From pancreas. Your pancreas. <coughs> okay. When you have a dysfunction of your blood sugar levels, 
This is known as diabetes. You guys with me so far? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna stick with this for just a little bit, okay? If you don't have enough glucose going into your brain or there's a fluctuation of blood glucose going to your brain, this is what happens. Your brain kicks in, it kicks off. It kicks in, it kicks off. It goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. What it's doing there is also controlling the vasodilation and vasoconstriction of your vessels. So if you have an uneven distribution of blood going to your brain, it does this to your vessels. Eventually what's gonna happen? Think of this if you will. Take a balloon. You got a balloon, right? You blow on it the first time, it's very hard to blow, and it bounces back into its original shape, yes? But you continue to blow air in that and release it, blow air into it and release it, what happens to that elasticity of the balloon? It wears out. It wears out, okay? That's what happens with someone who is diabetic. Their vessels wear out, and there's a lack of blood that gets stuck in the peripherals and it doesn't get returned back into the heart. Is that why they get like a lot of edema and just end up losing limbs? And yes, yes. Because now what's also happening is there isn't good, good uh, blood exchange, okay? And because of the lack of oxygen nutrients to those vessels, especially in the lower extremities. You start to lose them, right? Okay, that's where you lose a limb, okay? All right, adverse effects of anesthesia will also cause vasodilation. So the clinical manifestations of neurogenic shock includes low blood pressure, low heart rate, okay, that's bradycardia, okay, warm, dry skin initially, not a big deal, initial alertness, if not unconscious, and then cool extremities. Okay. Any questions on neurogenic shock? Again, what is your responsibility? Stop, stop the procedure. Yeah, exactly. Call stop what help. you're doing. Call for help. Stay with, uh, the stay with the patient. Get a crash cart. Get ready. Uh, take vitals every five minutes. Get ready to perform any type of life-sustaining procedures. So the that, only thing that really changes like kind of the position you're going to put the patient in, yeah, right? Yeah, it depends. Yeah, it depends. Sometimes you may lay them down. Sometimes you may sit them up. But shock is shock is shock is right. shock. Okay? It just depends on the origin. So. Here we go. Okay. <clears throat> Septic shock, this is also part of distributive. Septic shock has 40 to 50% mortality rate for its victims and occurs within 12 hours if not treated immediately. This is a single cause of death in the ICU today. Basically, <coughs> septic shock is a systemic, this is whole body, we're talking about whole body infection by bacteria where endotoxins are released, and then the body begins its immune response by releasing chemicals that increase capillary permeability in vasodilation. Again, your vessels are wide open, okay? So blood is not being pumped adequately throughout your body because of that vasodilation. This leads to the shock syndrome. So if you don't have blood circulating, okay, you can die immediately. Because we're talking systemically, not just a, a small area. We're talking about whole body. Okay, those that are susceptible to septic shock includes the aged and the very young. If you've had recent surgery, okay, reinsertion of a urinary catheter, a chronic disease. What we're talking about here are infections, guys. Infections. Infection that is spread throughout your body is in your circulatory system, your blood supply, and now you have a whole body infection and your vessels remain dilated. There is no blood flow, okay? That's all what we're talking about here, infections, okay? So, your clinical manifestations, the first phase in septic shock, you may experience high, dry, and a flushed skin. Again, here's the pattern. Your heart rate's gonna go up, your respiration, respiration's gonna go up. Fever, but possibly not in the elderly. You may experience some nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Normal to excessive urine output at first. Possible confusion, most common in the elderly patient. So again, in the first phase, nothing may be apparent. Okay, your blood pressure may be the same. Okay, your heart rate may be the same. 
but there might be an increase in respiration, there might be some changes in your level of consciousness, and there might be also a change in your urine output, initial. But as you can see here, again, as it becomes progressively worse, respiration's going up, heart rate's going down, urine output's going down, blood pressure's gonna go down, okay? Okay, cool pale skin, again, lack of blood flow. We've already discussed this part. Seizures and organ failure if syndrome is not reversed. Septic shock, you're, again, your response is stop what you're doing, get help, take vitals every five minutes, get the crash cart, don't leave the patient alone, be ready to assist, okay? It's the same thing over and over again, right? Same pattern. All right. We're going to stop right here, guys. We'll talk about anaphylactic reactions.